I am Dr. Van Abel presenting Lecture 4. A reminder that core concepts will be emphasized in the PowerPoint, but please refer to the study guide regarding chapters as well as to the textbook. And then go through the case study and multiple choice questions to ensure that you have mastered the specific um, topics in this presentation. Normal structural and functional development of a baby's gastrointestinal tract is essential for the baby to survive and to thrive. In some babies, there may be evidence of intestinal obstruction. In these cases, one can consider whether there is an anatomical obstruction or whether there is a functional problem. This can also affect the large and or the small bowel. Under the causes, it might be most commonly a congenital abnormality, which can be intrinsic as found with atresias, anorectal malformations or meconium ileus, or it can be extrinsic problems such as volvulus or annular pancreas that causes obstruction. It may also be acquired, and in this case, the most commonly associated um, condition is necrotizing enterocolitis. Functional causes of intestinal obstruction might include Hirschsprungs, where you have a ganglionosis of the bowel. It might be ileus due to sepsis or illness, and then peritonitis. A new note with intestinal obstruction can present in a variety of ways. The clinical features that can be expected are as follows. Vomiting is a commonly seen symptom. It is important to inquire regarding the timing of the vomiting, the volume, as well as the color. If the vomiting is bile stained, it implies that there is an obstruction below the second part of the duodenum, with other words, a high obstruction. Abdominal distension is not prominent in high obstructions, but is commonly seen with anorectal malformations, ileal and edenal atresias. Visible peristalsis may be present. Delayed passage of meconium is a very important sign. In a low obstruction, there be, may be no meconium passage at all, while in a high obstruction, there may be meconium stools for a day or two. Dehydration may occur, especially due to poor feeding and fluid loss. It is important to perform a blood gas and look for metabolic derangements. Pluremic metabolic alkalosis can be expected in babies with a high obstruction due to the loss of stomach acid. This will be aggravated by the loss of chloride and the compensatory mechanism in the kidney is then to reabsorb bicarbonate instead of chloride. The diagnosis of intestinal obstruction can be made antenatally. After a baby is born, an abdominal x-ray, an AP and a lateral view may assist to make a diagnosis. A contrast study might be necessary as ordered by the pediatric surgeon. When managing a baby with suspected intestinal obstruction, it is important to keep the baby nil by mouth and to insert a nasogastric tube. Decompress the stomach by aspiration and then place it on free drainage and ask the nursing staff to keep on aspirating every three hours to prevent further vomiting. Losses should be carefully charted to help you with the intake and the output calculations. When considering um, IV treatment, it is important to consider four aspects. Firstly, if the baby is shocked or hypovolemic, the baby may benefit from an isotonic fluid bolus, which is usually normal saline or ringer's lactate, at a dose of 10 milliliters per kilogram given over 30 to 60 minutes intravenously. Maintenance fluid should then be calculated according to the baby's age and weight, and this should be given intravenously as maintenance solution and total parental nutrition should start as soon as possible as the baby will likely be nil per os for a while. 
The previous day's losses should be replaced to correct the rehydration. And then one should also consider the ongoing losses to ensure that you don't fall behind again. Refer the baby to a pediatric surgeon in a tertiary or quaternary unit. Bowel rotation is a congenital abnormality that leads to incomplete fixation and rotation of bowel on returning to the fetal abdominal cavity between the 8th and the 10th weeks of gestation. This will lead to volvulus, which may contribute to impairment of the gut blood flow. Intestinal obstruction can happen episodically, and the baby may then present with signs of abdominal distension, bowel state vomiting, and a vague abdominal mass. If this is not addressed via laparotomy urgently by pediatric surgery, this can lead to full gut necrosis and mortality. Pyloric stenosis presents with projectile vomiting due to hypertrophy of the pyloric area of the stomach. Babies may present from birth to six months, but it most typically occurs between weeks three and five of life. There may be a family history as there is a genetic predisposition. Boys are four times more commonly affected than girls. On your clinical examination, you may find a mass in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. The ultrasound is used to identify the thickness of the pyloric area. Babies are managed by correcting the acid base, electrolyte and fluid status. In the end, surgery is required and during the RAMS test procedure, the muscle fibers of the hypertrophied pyloric area is, um, are incised um, down to the mucosa. An infant with duodenal obstruction usually presents quite early. The causes are duodenal atresia, duodenal stenosis, duodenal web, bowel rotation, or an annular pancreas which can cause um, extrinsic obstruction. It is important to examine the baby for other related conditions, such as Down syndrome, which is quite common in babies with duodenal atresia. Babies may present early on with bowel stained vomiting. Abdominal distension is not a prominent feature. And then you can appreciate on the abdominal x-ray a double bubble appearance which is indicative of a dilated stomach and dilated first part of the duodenum. Anorectal malformations can be classified in three groups, namely high, which occurs above the levator ani level, intermediate or low, which is below the levator ani level. Imperforate anus then is a perineum without an anal opening and this can be either high, which is in the rectal area, intermediate or low, which is in the anal area. A fistula may be present, such as rectovaginal or rectovestibular fistula or even an anocutaneous fistula, which can give temporarily relief from the obstruction. In any baby with imperforate anus, it's important to consider the vectoral association. These patients should be referred to pediatric surgery for a decompression colostomy and then a definitive operation when the baby is 6 to 12 months old. The outcome or complications that can be expected are fecal incontinence, recurrent urinary tract infections, as well as constipation. A baby with Hirschsprung's disease will present with large bowel obstruction due to an absence of ganglion cells in the Auerbach plexus of the gut, which will prevent the baby from passing stools as there is disorderly peristaltic activity. There is a strong association with Down syndrome and the baby should be carefully examined for that. They typically present with severe abdominal distension and failure to pass meconium regularly. On a rectal examination, there may be an explosive gush of meconium um, and then again progressive constipation until the next rectal examination is done.
Investigations include an abdominal x-ray where you can expect to see dilated bowel loops and fluid levels. A contrast study may be done, but in the end, the definitive diagnosis is made by a biopsy to prove the aganglionosis. Management includes um, daily or twice daily rectal irrigations and then colostomy if there is a significant obstruction or a primary repair. Omphalocele or exomphalos is an example of an abdominal wall defect where the bowel does not return to the abdomen at around 12 weeks gestation. The extra abdominal bowel is covered by a peritoneum and the umbilical cord can be seen at the apex of the defect. It may also rupture before delivery, so the clue is that this defect comes through the umbilical area. In 60 to 80 percent of cases, it is associated with other anomalies, particularly um, should be excluded congenital heart disease, beckwith wiedemann syndrome, and chromosomal disorders such as trisomy 13 and trisomy 18. Under the management strategy, it's important to prevent heat and fluid loss by covering the omphalocele area in sterile plastic. The baby should be referred for surgery, who will then make a decision on operative management and um, closure of the defect. In gastroschisis, there is herniation of the abdominal contents through a defect in the abdominal wall. This usually happens to the right of the umbilical cord. In gastroschisis, there is no covering of the bowel and therefore the bowel is loose in the amniotic cavity, which explains why the bowel can be scarred, prone to adhesions with resulting stenosis and strictures. Poor intestinal motility is also a common feature. Gastroschisis is not typically associated with other anomalies. There is an increased risk for bowel ischemia due to the small defect in the abdominal wall which can impair blood flow to the gut. An emergency referral for PEDS surgery is indicated. The bowel can be covered with plastic wrap, but it is important to not further impair the blood flow to the gut. The baby should be kept null per os and a nasogastric tube inserted. Intravenous fluid should be started with extra fluid added due to the risk of dehydration. This condition is often complicated by bowel dysfunction and ileus, and these patients typically only start feeding after two or three weeks. Short bowel syndrome is also a significant um, complication which is usually the result of bowel ischemia and bowel necrosis. Bloody stools are quite commonly found in neonates and it's important to have a good approach. Firstly, one should distinguish whether the blood is fresh or altered, whether it is on the outside or on top of the stool or mixed throughout the stool. And then obvi obviously other symptoms and signs should be considered, such as constipation, whether the baby has signs of abdominal distension or obstruction, or whether the baby has signs that can fit in with septicemia. In all cases, make sure to exclude necrotizing enterocolitis um, as a cause, and, and it's usually NEC until proven otherwise. Babies may swallow maternal blood, and maternal blood can be distinguished from fetal blood by performing the APS test. A rectal or anal fissure can be excluded through examination of the perineal area, specifically looking for little tears in the anal opening or to look for an ulcer. Now rotation can be diagnosed on clinical grounds as well as an abdominal x-ray, and this is a surgical emergency due to the risk of gut necrosis. Intersusception, quite rare in newborns. We don't see that very often. 
Hemorrhagic disease of the newborn can present with gastrointestinal hemorrhage, and this is particularly important in babies who did not receive vitamin K prophylaxis intramuscularly after birth. Benign hemorrhagic colitis can present with bloody stools due to cow's milk protein intolerance. Although gastroenteritis is rare in neonates, um, what it can happen, but other causes should also be investigated. And then lastly, a rectal polyp can also lead to bleeds. Necrotizing enterocolitis, or NEC, is an acquired bowel abnormality that is specifically found in preterm babies and that contributes greatly to the morbidity and mortality suffered by the most premature of babies. There is an inverse relation regarding the birth weight and um, many of the very low birth weight infants will then develop NEC with an overall mortality of even 10 to 30 percent and this can be even higher in babies born at less than 28 weeks. There are basically four pillars of predisposing factors, but the etiology is multifactorial and still poorly understood. It is largely a condition found in premature babies, and the more preterm, as I already stated, the more likely they are to develop NEC. However, in the most preterm babies, it can take a longer period of two to three weeks before they present. Mucosal injury can result due to the immature gut and mucosal defenses that can increase the likelihood of damage to the mucosal lining. Abnormal blood flow to the gut mucosa um, leads to hypoxia and relative ischemia, again causing an entry point for organisms to cause an infection. Examples of abnormal blood flow could be a baby with birth asphyxia or HIE, a patent ductus arteriosus, blood is also flowing away from the aorta through the ductus arteriosus and re-entering the lung circulation and therefore there's less perfusion of the gut um, and the peripheral organs. In polycythemia, especially with hyperviscosity syndrome, there's also sludging of the red blood cells through the microvasculature leading to relative hypoxia and ischemia. Babies that are born um, smaller for gestational age than expected um, are obviously also um, exposed to chronic hypoxia and poor perfusion of non-essential organs and therefore they should be considered as a high risk group for NEC. Extrange transfusion, especially if done through umbilical lines, can be a risk factor. Babies with cyanotic heart disease often live with very low saturation targets and therefore they are relatively ischemic and then in Hirschsprung's disease where there is a ganglionosis of a segment causing severe proximal dilatation of the gut can lead then to poor um, perfusion of the mucosal lining. It is important that this condition commonly affects the terminal ileum or sigmoid colon. It is rare for infants who have never been fed to develop NEC and therefore enteral feeds are considered one of the most important predisposing factors in the development of this condition. Formula feeds are specifically named as a risk factor as the risk compared to express breast milk is 7 to 10 times more likely to develop NEC. Pasteurized donor breast milk is three to four times more likely to develop NEC compared to raw maternal breast milk and therefore is at least a little bit preventative compared to formula. The indication for PDBM is to administer it to babies less than 1.8 kilograms in the first two weeks of life and the whole purpose is to enable the mother time and afford her time to start um, establishing her breast milk production while the baby is still critically ill. It should also be taken into consideration how quickly you increase the volume to reach full feeds as too rapid increase can also injure the immature gut. Studies have shown that increase of 30 mils per kg per day of feeds 
is not associated with an increased risk of NEC and therefore should be the maximum um, that you should consider. All additions to feeds can lead to hyperosmolarity, which will again lead to damage of the mucosal lining. Examples would be uh, medications that you give orally or giving 5% saline in feeds, and this should be discouraged. In the end, NEC is due to infection. So either the organism can be the initiating factor or infection can follow mucosal injury with translocation of organisms via the immature and damaged gut. This causes the invasion of a specifically gas-producing bacteria that um, can also then transition to a full-blown sepsis. Early in the course of NEC, the clinical features can be very nonspecific and commonly um, found features of prematurity and therefore a high index of suspicion is necessary when examining a baby on a day-to-day -day basis. Babies may present with temperature instability, specifically hypothermia or temperature dissociation between the central and the peripheral sites. The baby may also have feeding intolerance and nasogastric tube aspirates may be reported by the nursing staff. The baby might also have central nervous system derangements that leads to lethargy or apnea. On the abdominal examination, one could find history of blood and mucus in the stools. Abdominal distension might be an indication that there is ileus present. There might be tenderness during palpation. And as soon as there is red discoloration or a grey colour to the abdomen or edema of the abdominal wall, this is indicative of peritonitis and an advanced um, stage of NEC. Lastly, the baby can present with septic shock, with all the abnormalities that you expect of a baby that is in shock. When staging, there is a modified bowel staging, and it's more important to just remember the, the basics, um, and then you can fit the baby into one of these groups. Um, which considers the systemic signs, the intestinal signs, and incorporates that with the radiological signs. It also then helps you to make decisions on the management. So in stage one, that is suspected NEC, where the baby might have some temperature instability, apnea or bradycardia. There might be residual nasogastric tube aspiration and stomach distension. And... On the radiology, there might be normal or mild ileus and bowel edema. So this is the stage where NEC is actually suspected. In stage 2, it is definite NEC, where the baby can be mildly or moderately ill. At this stage, there, in, there is ileus as evidence on the abdominal x-ray with intestinal nematosis. And this can then progress to grade 2b, where the baby becomes more ill and portal vein gas can also be seen on the abdominal x-ray. In stage 3, the baby has advanced NEC and the baby can be severely ill with signs of hypertension, acidosis or even DIC. In stage 3a, the gut is still very ill, but pneumoperitoneum has not yet happened. With other words, the bowel has not yet perforated. And in the worst case scenario, 3b, the gut perforates and pneumoperitoneum can be seen on the abdominal x-ray. Special investigations to aid you in your management of NEC include septic markers, and here one usually starts with a full blood count, which may show a neutropenia or neutrophilia. A left shift will indicate that the bone marrow is producing immature white cells and pushing them into the circulation to help fight off the infection.
There might also be comments on toxic granulation of the neutrophils and thrombocytopenia is also a common finding. The C-reactive protein will rise and can be used to monitor the resolution of inflammation in the, in the gut. Obviously, microbiology is very important to establish the specific organism relate, uh, related to the NEC and a blood culture should definitely be done, preferably before you administer antibiotics. Often uh, coagulation studies may be indicated as DIC is also a common finding in severe NEC and septic shock. The diagnosis rests heavily on the radiological findings, with other words looking at the abdominal x-ray. It is important to always do an AP and a lateral x-ray when suspecting NEC. In suspected NEC, with other words bowel staging 1, you are looking for signs of ileus, and in this case, you should see um, tubes, not cubes, with other words, um, signs of an abnormal gas pattern indicating that the bowel is not moving adequately. There can also be thickening of the bowel walls that indicate that there is edema due to the inflammatory process. In definite NEC, you may expect nematosis intestinalis, which is air bubbles found in the bowel walls. And you can clearly see it on the x-ray, little tram lines of air found in the bowel walls. Just a word of caution, sometimes you can't see it clearly in the bowel wall, but there might be little bubbles seen, and that is always nematosis until proven otherwise. In 2B, the air can also then spread to the portal vein, and as seen on the x-ray, you can see portal vein gas which might be a poor prognostic sign. And then lastly, in 3B, the bowel can perforate and you may see pneumoperitoneum. This is best seen on a lateral view of the abdomen. On the lateral abdominal x-ray, you can appreciate free air, indicating that pneumoperitoneum is present. With other words, the bowel has perforated and the air is pushing the liver and the bowels downwards. When managing a baby with NEC, it is very important to establish whether the baby is in septic shock or not. In this case, resuscitation and stabilizing the patient is of paramount importance to avoid further morbidity and mortality. When approaching the baby, the ABC approach can be used and if the baby has difficulty in breathing, it is important to avoid mask ventilation as excess air transmitted through the esophagus to the stomach can lead to overdistension of the gut and can lead to bowel perforation. So these babies should preferably be immediately intubated. It is important to consider the circulation and whether a bolus of resuscitation fluid may be required and or inotropes added to the management strategy. In the end, this is an infection and therefore broad spectrum antibiotics should be administered as soon as possible, preferably after a blood culture has been taken, but this should not be delayed. It is important to immediately stop all feeds and to decompress the stomach by inserting a nasogastric tube and aspirating the stomach contents. After this, it's important to rest the bowel with a nasogastric tube on free drainage. It is a good idea to aspirate three hourly to ensure removal of excess fluid and air from the stomach. Intravenous fluid should be started, and as the baby will be null by mouth for three to 14 days, total parenteral nutrition should be started as soon as possible. It is important to correct metabolic and electrolyte disorders um, which are common findings if a baby is critically ill. Surgical intervention may be necessary and involving the pediatric surgeon early in the course of NEC is important. They will intervene if there is pneumoperitoneum and one 
can then expect them to either put in peripheral drains through local anesthesia or to consider the baby for a laparotomy if necrotic bowel seems to be present. If there's clinical deterioration with metabolic acidosis, a rise in your potassium and phosphate levels, necrotic bowel may be the cause and therefore the surgeon should be consulted whether um, a laparotomy may be indicated. Um, surgeons will also follow up x-rays and on serial x-rays if there is a sentinel loop, with other words, a loop that is not moving, um, that might be an indication that there is necrotic bowel and the baby will then again qualify for a surgical intervention. The first permanent nephrons appear at around eight weeks gestational age and this process with nephrogenesis is complete by 36 weeks gestation. It is important to remember that the fetal kidney greatly contributes to the volume of the amniotic fluid and therefore the kidneys are basically functional. Although the placenta is still removing all the waste products, when the baby is born, there is a sudden increase in the glomerular filtration rate and 90% of newborns will then pass urine within the first 24 hours after birth. On day one, the urine output is still scanty at around 0.5 moles per kg per hour, but thereafter it increases to 2 to 3 moles per kilogram per hour. When investigating a neonate for a renal disorder, it's important to consider the UNE and creatinine. But it's important to remember that it's not useful to do the UNE usually within the first 12 to 24 hours after birth as it will still reflect the mother's renal function. After 24 hours, the UNE can be used and it is important to just keep in mind the normal values for the neonatal period. The most commonly used special investigation is the renal ultrasound where you can evaluate the structure of the renal tract and the renal Doppler might be able to give information regarding the blood flow in and out of the kidney. The MAG3 scan is a test where radioactive tracer is injected intravenously and then the excretion curves are then plotted and you can easily then see obstruction of the excretion of this tracer. The DMSA scan is a static scan, and on this investigation you can identify renal scarring or dysplasia. When vesicoureteric reflux is suspected, a micturating cystoerythrogram can be performed where radiopaque dye can be injected into the bladder through a urinary catheter and then the scan will show where the dye refluxes into the ureters and into the kidneys. When there is an obstruction to urinary flow in the renal system, it can lead to obstructive uropathy. The most common causes are pelvic ureteric junctional obstruction, posterior urethral valves as seen in male babies and then an ureterocele. On presentation, many of these conditions can be diagnosed antenatally with a good antenatal ultrasound. In the most severe of cases, poor urine output can lead to oligohydramnias, which will then lead to appearance of Potter syndrome with very specific facial features namely epicantic folds, extra loose folds on the face, a beaked nose, and then abnormal and low set ears. Due to oligohydramnios, there might also be pulmonary hyperplasia, which can lead to severe respiratory distress and even can lead to mortality. In some cases, prune belly syndrome um, might be the the result of urinary problems and therefore you have the wrinkled skin on the abdomen. There might also be palpable bladder or kidneys on examination of the abdomen. The urinary stream is also important and there might be a dribbling of urine if there is an obstruction to urine 
flow. Posterior urethral valves are commonly seen in little boys where the mucosal folds um, stretch into the lumen of the urethra and this then produces a valve-like obstruction pattern. This obstruction to flow can lead to dilatation and hypertrophy of the urethra and also the bladder, ureter and up to the kidneys. This can be diagnosed antenatally on an ultrasound and then on examination you can see dribbling of, of urine from the penis. You might feel the bladder and um, they can often have um, related um, history of oligohydramnios or even pulmonary hyperplasia. Then um, in the management, they can treat this by surgical ablation of the folds and in very severe obstruction, it might need a vesicostomy. It's important to look out um, for abnormal kidney functions and to check the urine output. As the obstruction is resolved, it might actually lead to renal failure um, with a high output and then associated complications should be managed appropriately. There are many disease processes that can lead to acute renal failure or um, acute kidney injury, which is the newer term. When you look at the causes, they are mainly in three groups, namely pre-renal, renal and post-renal. The most common group is the pre-renal group and this is often associated with poor perfusion of the kidneys due to dehydration, hypertension as one would find in shock, asphyxia and hypothermia. Regarding renal diseases, it is usually intrinsic with damages to the kidney itself due to acute tubular necrosis and infection. And then post-renal causes might include obstructive uropathy. A patient with renal failure has a specific clinical presentation and these signs and symptoms can also lead to complications associated with a poor kidney function. The first sign is oliguria and this is identified by inserting a urinary catheter to measure the hourly urine output. Once it drops below one mole per kg per hour, the baby is deemed to be oliguric and if there's no urine output, the baby is anuric. This will then lead to fluid overload with clinical signs of edema and fluid overload and this can then progress to complications with congestive heart failure and hypertension. When there is a buildup of urea, the patient may have a depressed level of consciousness and then on your blood results, you can expect to see a rising urea and creatinine. Metabolic acidosis can worsen and due to inability of the kidney to excrete potassium and phosphate, you will face hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. The hyponatremia is largely a result of the fluid overload. And then lastly, you can have cardiac dysrhythmias due to hyperkalemia, which needs to be addressed early in order to prevent um, a sudden cardiac arrest. The management of a patient with acute kidney injury and then renal failure includes addressing the underlying cause that needs to be um, treated correctly. And then one should aim for fluid restriction to maintain a, a negative or a neutral fluid balance. In this case, you can include the sensible losses as well as the insensible losses and not give anything more than that. The protein and potassium should be restricted and electrolyte imbalances should be addressed and the metabolic acidosis should be followed up and one could give Sodabic in this case um, after consultation with a specialist. In the end, if the kidneys are severely damaged and the renal functions are deranged, one could consult a nephrologist to do um, a peritoneal dialysis.
but this is not done readily in neonates. Neonatal jaundice is one of the most commonly found problems in the neonatal period. 50% of term babies and up to 85% of preterm babies will develop jaundice in the first week or so of life. Jaundice is then due to deposition of bilirubin in either the skin, sclera and or the mucous membranes and this leads to the yellow colour. It is important to remember that jaundice is a clinical sign and not a diagnosis. To make the diagnosis, it is important to know the physiology of bilirubin metabolism and then to add that to the clinical examination and special investigations. So in bilirubin metabolism, it is important to remember that bilirubin comes largely from a breakdown of the red blood cells. The heme is changed through heme oxygenase to biliverdin, which is then changed to bilirubin. This unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble and can easily cross the blood brain barrier. The bilirubin binds to serum albumin which carries it in the blood to reach the liver and in the liver the X and Y ligandins accept this complex and then bilirubin is changed by glucuronosyl transferase to be conjugated and this will make it more water soluble. Conjugated bilirubin is excreted into the gut of the baby and then changed by a bowel bacteria into urobilinogen that can be excreted by the kidney or stercobilinogen that is excreted in the stools. Once the, unconjugated, once the conjugated bilirubin is in the gut and it's not excreted, it can enter the intrahepatic circulation by being broken down again by glucuronidase into unconjugated uh, bilirubin. And this will then precipitate the jaundice. Once a baby presents with neonatal jaundice, all effort should be made to make a specific diagnosis. To determine the cause, it will be important to take a good history, to do a thorough clinical examination, to do special investigations, and then to make a diagnosis. The management can then be in general or then specific to the cause for the specific patient. Unconjugated neonatal jaundice can be divided into two groups, namely physiological process or pathological jaundice. Physiological jaundice is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. With other words, a thriving baby with no specific cause and usually these patients do not need any intervention and the levels do not cross the phototherapy threshold. In pathological jaundice, babies need to be worked up for possible causes. This applies to babies who become jaundiced in the first 24 hours, and these patients usually have a high risk of having hemolytic disease, and this is the assumed diagnosis until proven otherwise. A mother that is known RH negative with RH antibodies implies that the fetus might have been exposed to these antibodies that can cross the placenta and therefore these babies need to be admitted and special investigations done. Preterm babies with bilirubin levels beyond 150 and term babies with bilirubin levels beyond 200 micromoles per litre must be um, plotted on the graph and managed appropriately. All babies with obstructive or conjugated jaundice must be further evaluated as this is always a, a pathological process. Babies that remain jaundice for longer periods, with other words more than a week in term babies and more than two weeks in preterm babies, are um, deemed to have prolonged jaundice and therefore should also receive a workup for um, other causes like sepsis, urinary tract infections, and then in, especially in conjugated jaundice, this is a time for biliary atresia and neonatal hepatitis to present. It is important to always plot the bilirubin level on the treatment threshold graphs to ensure that for a specific gestational age and weight, whether it is physiological or a pathological process.
the most worrisome complication of pathological neonatal jaundice is the risk of bilirubin encephalopathy and Karen Yggdras. As already mentioned, unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble and can easily penetrate the blood brain barrier. Bilirubin is neurotoxic and can affect the basal ganglia, hippocampus, and the subthalamic nuclei. And this yellow staining is referred to as Karen Icterus. In acute bilirubin encephalopathy, you can expect to find a lethargic baby or a very irritable baby. High-pitched cry is often described. And then the most important sign is to look for abnormalities in the muscle tone of the patient. Babies usually start off as hypotonic, and this then progresses to hypertonicity. And as you can see in the pictures, the baby can have opistotonus, retrocollis, and this is indicative then of increased tone. Babies might also present with fever, apnea, seizures, as the bilirubin can also damage the cortex of the brain, and then the worst case scenario, it can lead to death. Bilirubin encephalopathy can cause chronic disability and is one of the leading causes of cerebral palsy that can be prevented. Because of the toxicity of the bilirubin to the basal ganglia, the cerebral palsy type that is most commonly found is chorioathetoid um, CP. And the bilirubin is also toxic to the nerve cells of the ears and therefore high frequency deafness can result. Patients may also um, later on experience intellectual impairment and then there might be paralysis of the upward gaze or paranoid sign. When considering the role of breastfeeding in jaundice, it's important to distinguish between two um, possible causes, namely breastfeeding associated jaundice and breast milk jaundice. In breastfeeding associated jaundice, these neonates present in the first week of life um, due to uh, calorie and fluid deprivation and delayed passage of stools. This is because the mother is still producing colostrum in the first few days, after which the mother's milk production will increase. In this time, the baby is basically dehydrating and therefore it increases um, the risk of jaundice. This condition is managed by simply increasing the frequency of breastfeeding and ensuring that the baby does not dehydrate any further. In breast milk jaundice, it is postulated that elevated beta-glucuronidase levels in breast milk can break down the conjugated bilirubin and therefore increase the enterohepatic circulation. Free fatty acids can also be found in breast milk and the, these acids can then compete for albumin binding signs, releasing more unconjugated bilirubin. This is largely a diagnosis of exclusion and as it tends to be prolonged, one should also just exclude all the other conditions that can lead to prolonged pathological jaundice. There is no treatment necessary in this case. A new neonate who is hemolyzing um, should be investigated for possible causes. It is important to have an approach and I suggest that you consider firstly extravascular hemolysis and then intravascular hemolysis. Examples of extravascular hemolysis would be a kephal hematoma or swallowed maternal blood as those red blood cells still need to be broken down and metabolized. In intravascular hemolysis, it can either be immune-mediated or non-immune-mediated. The most common immune-mediated um, neonatal jaundice stems from RH incompatibility or ABO incompatibility. In non-immune hemolysis, one can consider conditions affecting the red blood cell, either the membrane of the red blood cell or the um, processes taking place in the cell. Um, things that can affect here is spherocytosis or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, 
a few words on RH incompatibility. It is quite a complex antigen, including um, CD and E antigens. And in 95% of cases, RH incompatibility involves the capital D antigen. 83% of the population is RH positive, and therefore only about 17% will be RH negative for the D antigen. If a mom is RH negative and fetal blood cells reach her circulation, she can be sensitized and this immunoglobulin G can then cross the placenta to cause hemolysis of foreign fetal red blood cells, with other words, if the baby or the fetus rather is RH positive. The management in pregnancy is important, so especially in the first pregnancy, all mothers should be, prospective mothers should be screened for the RH factor, and if the mother is RH negative, she should re uh, receive anti-D gamma globulin just in case fetal blood cells reach her circulation. And this will then prevent sensitization and protect further pregnancies. If a mother is in a second or third pregnancy, it is important to screen for antibodies, and this will help you make a risk assessment for the fetus. The fetus is closely monitored for signs of anemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and in the worst case scenario, high drops fetalis. When a neonate um, is born, it's important to investigate already at birth the hemoglobin level, the bilirubin level, as well as send a blood group and Coombs to blood bank. If the baby is, cum, is uh, RH negative, then the risk for the fetus is, is zero. And if the baby is Coombs positive, you know that um, there are sensitized red cells that will hemolyze. This will then also help you to manage the patients appropriately. The neonates are all started on phototherapy and exchange transfusion might be considered once the bilirubin levels um, reach the exchange transfusion lines on the, on the threshold charts. Immunoglobulin is also controversial but can be given to capture the drifting antibodies in the bloodstream of the neonate and therefore to prevent further sensitization of the fetal and the neonatal red blood cells. ABO incompatibility is commonly found and is usually not as serious as RH incompatibility. In the most common form, the maternal blood group is O, with other words, she does not have A or B antigens. If the fetus then has A or B antigens and there's a mixing of blood and the fetal blood cells reach the maternal circulation, the mother can produce antibodies that can then cross the placenta. Only 10% of women make IgG class antibodies instead of IgM and um, this can then lead to hemolysis in the fetus. This may occur in the first pregnancy, which is different from RH incompatibility, where it's quite rare to find it in the first pregnancy, but where it gets worse with every subsequent pregnancy if the mother has been sensitized. The direct Coombs is usually negative or weakly positive, so this should not surprise you. Um, it is actually quite surprising to get a strong positive Coombs um, in ABO incompatibility. When a baby is clinically jaundiced, it is important to start with a few baseline investigations to determine a cause and to help you with your management strategy. If the first line results do not give you any answers, it is then important to do further investigations. Firstly, the bilirubin level should be taken with a total and a conjugated fraction to exclude pathological jaundice. Um, in, especially if it's conjugated. It is important to check and plot on the chart and it, as you can see on the phototherapy and exchange transfusion guidelines you must have the age in hours and you must determine which line to use and this you will distinguish um, by looking at the gestational age and the birth weight of the baby. If there is a discrepancy between the gestational age and the weight, you always take the safer line, which is the lower of the two lines, and plot the baby according to that, those parameters. Please read the fine print on the charts.
If there are any risk factors, you may also use the line lower than the dedicated line um, to ensure that the baby is properly managed. The bilirubin should be repeated as indicated. So if it is a low risk um, and the baby is not very jaundiced, you can repeat it daily. But if the baby is hemolyzing or has had asphyxia or low albumin levels, etc., you can put it on the high risk group and then you should repeat the bilirubin levels every 6 to 12 hours to see the response to your management. The hemoglobin level should be taken to look for polycythemia or to look for signs of hemolysis with anemia. The blood group and direct cooms is indicated, especially if the baby it presents with jaundice in the first day of life or if there are signs of hemolysis on the FBC. Jaundice can be worsened by dehydration, so especially in three and four day olds um, with breastfeeding associated jaundice, it is important to do the UNE and creatinine level to exclude severe dehydration. If the baby has signs of sepsis, the white cell count, inflammatory markers like the CRP can be done um, together with a blood culture. In conjugated jaundice, one should exclude the torch infection group. In prolonged jaundice, thyroid functions may be indicated and further investigations such as liver ultrasound or G6PD deficiency screens. In the management of unconjugated jaundice, it is important to focus on prevention and this will include early feeding to prevent dehydration and to prevent elevated free fatty acid levels in the bloodstream as the free fatty acids will combine, will compete again for the binding sites on the albumin. Adequate fluid intake should be ensured, and again, this would relate to proper breastfeeding techniques and support of the mother, especially in the first few days when colostrum is being produced. Feeding will also minimize intrahepatic circulation, and therefore, baby that is jaundice, it's actually a good idea to feed them and not keep them null by mouth. Phototherapy is the most important management strategy for a baby with jaundice and it works by isomerization of the bilirubin molecule in the baby's skin. Two processes can take place. It can either ch change the configuration of the molecule, which means that it is not permanent and will revert back on stopping the phototherapy. Or there can be permanent structural changes where the bilirubin will not revert back to its um, normal form after the phototherapy has been stopped. In this case, the lumirubin is formed and this is a water-soluble um, molecule that can be excreted in the urine. During phototherapy, a very specific color spectrum is targeted as these wavelengths best penetrate the skin and can cause the necessary changes in the bilirubin molecule. The color spectrum most commonly used is in the blue and green spectrum, and this is in the 460 to 490 nanometer wavelength group. Devices that can deliver this phototherapy is either conventional incandescent lights, quartz halogen lights, fluorescent lights, LED, or even fiber optic. Phototherapy can be delivered either from overhead or it can be placed underneath the baby as one would see with a billy blanket. If a baby has very severe jaundice and we talk about double or triple phototherapy, we use both the overhead and the underneath um, roots to deliver the light energy to the baby. To optimize the efficacy of phototherapy, it is important to consider a few different factors. Firstly, the color spectrum that we talked about in the blue spectrum is the most efficacious. One should consider the irradiance and the energy output of the source of the light, and which will then also give a specific dose. One can use a different number of lights, so we often talk of double or triple phototherapy when we use um, two or three lights on a patient. The distance from the source of the light to the patient is important and it should usually be around 30 centimeters. The time spent under phototherapy 
should be considered. So if the mother keeps on taking the baby out from under the phototherapy for breastfeeding, it might actually severely impact on the efficacy of your treatment. The surface area of exposed skin is important. The more skin is exposed, the better it will work and therefore the baby should be exposed fully with wearing no nappy and preferably no clothing or caps. Phototherapy is a safe management strategy and has been used for many, many years. However, there are a few complications to keep in mind. Firstly, the baby can have temperature instability. Specifically, they tend to become hypothermic as the light source does emit energy that is penetrating the baby's skin. If the baby is hypothermic, it can worsen dehydration and therefore we compensate by adding additional fluids to the maintenance fluids that we calculate daily. A baby may also experience pseudodiarrhea due to a decreased bowel transit time and due to lactose intolerance as it influences the lactase enzyme. Retinal damage has been ex uh, described in animal models and therefore the eyes are covered to prevent this from happening as well as to protect the baby's sleeping time with all the bright light. It might negatively impact on the baby's resting state. A bronze baby may occur if you um, administer uh, phototherapy to a baby with conjugated jaundice that can change in color. And then not to forget that you are separating the mother and the baby and it can be quite stressful for the new mother and can negatively affect um, the mother-infant bonding. A double volume exchange transfusion is indicated once the bilirubin levels plot beyond the exchange transfusion line on the bilirubin chart. A double volume exchange means that 160 mls per kg of fresh whole blood will be ordered from the blood bank and then will be exchanged for the neonate's blood in aliquots of 5 to 10 mls as tolerated. The whole aim of an exchange is to prevent bilirubin encephalopathy. This is um, happens by removing the unconjugated bilirubin in the blood one will also remove antibodies that will cause further hemolysis of the neonatal red blood cells. Sensitized red cells that are destined to hemolyze will be replaced by um, fresh whole blood. And then you can also restore the blood volume should the baby be anemic. And it also provides free albumin for bilirubin binding that will again decrease the risk of um, crossing of the blood-brain barrier. The decision to undertake an exchange transfusion is not made lightly as there are significant complications for this procedure. It can even lead to the death of a baby. More commonly, they can have electrolyte disturbances. Babies might be Glucose unstable with either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So this is monitored regularly during the procedure. The risk of infection is quite low, but cytomegalovirus, hepatitis B, as well as HIV um, are possibilities. But due to our um, screen in blood bank, this is negligible. Um, there might be embolism of air or thrombus as we often use central lines to do the procedure. Due to disruption of the gastrointestinal um, blood perfusion, it can lead to an increased risk for necrotizing intracolitis and therefore the baby is kept mill by mouth during this procedure. It might lead to fluid overload or hypovolemia. It can also contribute to acidosis, hypoxia, bradycardia, and can lead to cardiac arrest. Due to the removal of the baby's um, blood, there can also be hemorrhage and disturbances in the clotting profile, and then it might also lead to benign intrahepatic cholestasis. In a patient with proven RH or ABO incompatibility, one can consider immunoglobulins, 
that may reduce the need then for exchange transfusion. There's actually little evidence that it decreases the mortality or the neurodevelopmental sequelae, but as we try our best to avoid exchange transfusion and all its complications, we often try this treatment modality. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is always a pathological process and all these patients should be admitted for further investigations. Possible causes can be classed into surgical and hepatitis groups. In the surgical group, bile duct abnormalities um, must be excluded and specifically biliary atresia, which has to be treated within the first 40 to 60 days of a neonate's life. Inspissated bile as well as colidocal cyst are other examples. Obstructive causes could be an annular pancreas or pyloric stenosis, which can be excluded by an abdominal ultrasound. In the hepatitis group, infections are the most common reason, um, specifically sp systemic infections, as one would see with gram-negative sepsis, and then torch infections in the congenital group together with hepatitis B and HIV should be excluded. In the metabolic group, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, galactosemia, and cystic fibrosis are all rare causes but um, should be excluded. In the endocrine group, hypothyroidism should be excluded, especially as this can lead to irreversible mental retardation. In the iatrogenic group, total parental nutrition, especially if it is given for prolonged periods of time, specifically more than two weeks, it can lead to toxicity and damage to the liver, and this can contribute then to hepatitis and cause a conjugated um, jaundice. One condition that one should not miss and should not forget about is biliary atresia. In biliary atresia, they are absent or atretic bile ducts. In 30%, there might be other associated abnormalities that need to be excluded, specifically in the renal and cardiac systems. There may be an abnormal spleen or malrotation of the gut, and the patients might also have situs inversus. The onset of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia typically um, starts at around 10 days, but it may even take up to as long as four weeks for the babies to present. The Kasai procedure must be done as soon as possible, preferably before 60 days, as this condition leads to irreversible liver cirrhosis, and then the babies are not operable and may need a liver transplant. As you can see in the pictures, it's important to inquire regarding the color of the stool. If there is no bile reaching the gut, then obviously the stools will have this white um, pasty color. Hematological disorders. It is important to consider the normal physiology around the time of birth regarding placental transfusion. Delayed cord clamping is now the standard of care and is a principle taught in the Helping Babies Breathe program. Placental transfusion can contribute up to 25% of the total neonatal blood volume and therefore it is important not to clamp the cord too early. The average blood volume of a neonate is 85 to 90 moles per kilogram and the HB at term for a term baby is around 15 to 23.5 grams per deciliter. Anemia in a neonate can be classified as mild, moderate and severe. Once the hemoglobin level drops below 8 grams per deciliter, the baby's oxygen carrying capacity may not be adequate to maintain normal organ function, particularly in the brain. And therefore, it is controversial when to actually intervene and give packed cells. Um, there is a movement towards being more conservative and not to transfuse if the baby remains asymptomatic. But you can refer to the local guidelines regarding transfusion. We are now going to discuss the causes, which you can group into large groups, namely physiological anemia and anemia of prematurity, hemorrhages, hemolysis, and then a scarce group, 
that relates to aplasia and hypoplasia. A new nate is born with a relatively high hemoglobin level due to the hypoxic environment whilst intrauterine. Once the baby is born, the saturations increase dramatically and this will then blunt the normal physiological response as the kidneys will then recognize hyperoxia and shut off the erythropoietin production. Once the nodder is reached at 8 to 12 weeks in a term baby with lower levels of hemoglobin of 9 to 10 grams per deciliter, the kidneys will then um, start producing erythropoietin, the bone marrow will be stimulated to produce red blood cells and the anemia will resolve. So this is all a normal physiological process. In a preterm baby, this physiological process is actually exaggerated due to the transition and it is more severe and more prolonged than found in term infants and it is called then anemia of prematurity. Factors that could be contributing is physiologically that the baby is showing rapid body growth with a shortened red blood cell lifespan which is 60 to 90 days instead of 120 and again low plasma um, erythropoietin levels. There can also be non-physiological contributors such as repeated blood sampling which is necessary to make sure that the baby is um, well managed as a neonate and there might also be hemodilution. They might be iron deficient as they miss out on the last trimester of iron stores and hemolysis can also be contributing for instance if the preterm baby suffers from a vitamin E deficiency. Hemorrhage will obviously also result in anemia. This can happen before or during the delivery of a neonate and can have placental causes such as found at placenta previa or abrupture placenta which um, can give you antepartum hemorrhage. Fetal causes may be fetal maternal or twin to twin transfusion where the one uh, baby will then be anemic and the other one polycythemic. In vasa previa the vessels of the cord may rupture and can get to lead to massive blood loss and hypovolemic shock in the newborn. Neonatal causes will include trauma such as cephalhematomas or subaponeurotic bleeds and hemorrhage of dis hemorrhagic disease of the newborn due to vitamin K deficiency can lead to um, significant bleeds from the gastrointestinal tract and in the worst case scenario can lead to um, intracranial hemorrhage. Hemolysis can be divided into two groups, namely immune and then non-immune hemolysis. So we've already discussed immune hemolysis with RH and ABO incompatibility being most common. And the immunoglobulin G will then cross the placenta and cause damage to the fetal red blood cells. The maternal autoimmune diseases like SLE can also lead to hemolysis um, via the same route with the antibodies circulating for anything from three to six or even nine months after the baby was born. So it can have a significant effect even beyond the neonatal period. In non-immune hemolysis, congenital infection and disseminated intravascular coagulation must be considered in a baby that has um, raised septic markers or other causes of DIC and one can then also evaluate the red blood cells for spherocytosis or enzyme deficiencies such as G6PD or pyruvite kinase deficiency. In vitamin E deficiency the red blood cells are also more fragile and can easily hemolyze and alpha thalassemia is one of the rarer causes that can lead to hemolysis. Anemia can also occur due to bone marrow failure, which is called aplasia or hyperplasia, where there is impaired red blood cell production. And just for completeness sake, Black Van Diamond is such a syndrome where you have a genetic disorder leading to bone marrow failure. 
It is autosomal dominant and as you can see quite rare. Hydrops fetalis is a term used for a neonate born with severe and generalized edema and who has fluid collections in at least two of the visceral cavities, namely pleural effusions, ascites or pericardial effusions. The differential diagnosis is very broad and therefore this just describes a symptom complex irrespective of the cause. The causes of Hydrops fetalis can be divided into immune and non-immune causes. The most common immune cause would be RH incompatibility. This is a condition that we rarely see to develop Hydrops fetalis these days due to improved antenatal care and the administration of Rogam to prevent sensitization of the mother to her fetus. Um, in the non-immune group, the overwhelming majority have idiopathic cause. With other words, you cannot find a specific cause. Other conditions to consider would be a fetus with chronic anemia, a fetus with cardiac failure due to structural heart lesions or non-structural heart lesions such as supraventricular tachycardia, hyperproteinemia, Intrauterine infection, specifically the torch group, is well known to have babies then develop Hydrops fetalis in utero. And then congenital malformations and genetic abnormalities is also associated. Examples here would be trisomy 13, 18 and 21. Polycythemia is a common condition found amongst newborns and is defined as a venous hematocrit on free-flowing blood of 65% or more, and this correlates with the hemoglobin level above 22 grams per deciliter. Polycythemia can be the result of various causes. The most common one we see is chronic intrauterine hypoxia, with other words, small foot gestational babies that do not grow well in utero are usually starved of oxygen and nutrients, and therefore they have a need for increased um, oxygen carrying capacity. Post mature babies where the placenta cannot supply in the demand of the of the fetus and these patients are often also born with very high hemoglobin levels. It might be excessive transfusion of blood which is hydrogenic or which can happen in twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Infants of diabetics as well as big with Wiedemann syndrome are usually large for gestational age babies and have increased risk for developing polycythemia. And then Down syndrome is another condition to consider. Neonates with polycythemia usually look plethoric and one should then carefully examine the baby for other signs and symptoms of hyperviscosity syndrome. So the viscosity of blood depends on the packed cell volume or the hematocrit, but also on the deformability of the red blood cells as well as the plasma viscosity. It can affect various organ systems and in the central nervous system babies can exhibit apnea, lethargy, tremors, irritability and even convulsions. In the cardiopulmonary um, organ system, one may have pulmonary plethora and pulmonary hypertension and the babies can also have signs of heart failure. Renal vein thrombosis may affect the kidneys and the babies can have oliguria. Due to an increased risk for necrotizing enterocolitis, one should be careful when feeding a baby with polycythemia. Babies should also be screened for hypoglycemia they might also develop acidosis and hypoxia that might necessitate oxygen therapy and thrombocytopenia is also an associated factor. The management um, is a dilutional exchange, especially if the hematocrit goes higher than 75% or between 65 and 75% if there are clear signs of hyperviscosity syndrome. Uh, which is compromising the neonatal um, period.
Anticoagulation is a very complicated process and obviously not as well developed in term and especially preterm babies than in adults. So newborns often present with bleeding and then they need a special workup to ensure that the most important causes are excluded. So firstly, thrombocytopenia is one of the leading causes. There may be clotting factor deficiency or abnormal capillaries, or it can be a combination of all of these. As with all conditions, one has to start with a good history and a good clinical examination of the bleeding newborn. In this algorithm, you can see that you should inquire regarding a family history of bleeding as certain X-linked and autosomal-linked um, abnormalities can lead to deficiencies in the clotting system. One should also consider whether the baby is sick or whether the baby is healthy. In an ill newborn with sepsis, there are various reasons why the clotting factor may fail, such as DIC. In the healthy newborn, one can consider a congenital or acquired factors, and the most important acquired factor would then be vitamin K deficiency that can lead to hemorrhagic disease. Once you have um, examined the baby for specific signs and symptoms, one can then proceed to choose the most reliable special investigations to aid you in making a diagnosis. Thrombocytopenia is a common finding in the neonatal period. The clinical features associated with low platelets are petechiae or purpura on the skin. There can be ecchymosis, which is um, larger signs of bleeding. There can also be bleeding from nearly any site, but the most devastating will probably be the intracranial hemorrhage. Thrombocytopenia should be investigated again for an underlying cause, and infection is probably one of the most commonly found reasons for a drop in the platelets. Any bacterial infection, but specifically gram-negative sepsis and yeast infections, can lead to thrombocytopenia. The torch infections, especially when the baby presents at birth with a low platelet count, should be excluded. In isoimmune thrombocytopenia, the maternal uh, IgG antibodies are also produced against the antigens on the platelets of the fetus. So it works basically like an immune hemolysis but just um, destroying the platelets that can lead then to low platelet counts. One should also consider maternal diseases such as PET. Um, so the babies are often born um, with placental insufficiency and help, if, especially if the mother has HELP syndrome, the baby can also have low platelets. In idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, the mother is also making antibodies against her own platelets and that can cross the placenta and also affect the neonate, and in SLE, once again, it is an immune response. Disseminated intravascular coagulation is another reason, as all the platelets are then um, used up for the abnormal coagulation processes that occur. Hemorrhagic disease of the newborn is the result of deficiency of vitamin K-dependent clotting factors namely factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. The neonate is especially vulnerable as breast milk has low levels of vitamin K, and vitamin K is usually produced by bacterial flora of the gut, but the neonate is born with a sterile bowel, and therefore it will take three to six months before vitamin K is actually being produced in the baby's own body. The clinical features of hemorrhagic disease of the newborn can be divided into early and late. So in the early phase, it presents usually in the first week of life, classically within the first day to seven days. And in the late phase, it can be between two and even as long as 12 weeks. The clinical features include spontaneous bleeding, specifically from the gastrointestinal system, but it can also be from the umbilical stump. It is exacerbated after circumcision and in the worst case scenario, intracranial hemorrhage can occur. And this is specifically a high risk if you have late hemorrhagic disease of the newborn.
and um, it can lead to severe neurological sequelae. To prove the diagnosis, one should send in coagulation profile for the patient, and here you expect to find a prolonged prothrombin time, or PT, which will assess the extrinsic plotting pathway, namely factors 2, 5, 7, and 10, and this is not markedly affected by heparin. A normal partial thromboplastin time is expected. This will be assessing the intrinsic clotting pathway. Um, it can be prolonged by heparin contamination. And then obviously you need normal platelets on your full blood count. In the emergency setting, the treatment indicated is vitamin K, which can be administered subcutaneously or intramuscularly. This should be done after taking the blood samples so as not to influence your investigation results. Important to consider that the intramuscular route may cause a hematoma due to the poor clotting, and then uh, intravenous um, dose can be given. Anaphylaxis is a rare complication. In the acute setting, one can consider fresh frozen plasma to um, supplement the clotting factors. And if the baby presents in hypovolemic shock due to blood loss, one can administer a whole blood transfusion. Prevention is better than cure, and therefore routine vitamin K is indicated at birth. Take note that it should be an intramuscular injection of 0 0.5 to 1 milligrams intramuscularly, which is the conocion that you will see the sisters administering right after birth. It is important not to give an oral dose unless there is a proper protocol that is being followed, and these are not well studied for efficacy. Um, so it is not absorbed properly, and therefore you need to give a dose at birth, repeat it in the first week, and then repeat it again in the months that follow. So it's better to just give an intramuscular bolus. If the baby does not receive prophylaxis, there is a up to 1.7% chance for early hemorrhagic disease and um, seven cases out of 100,000 for late. It's still worth preventing this condition, especially if a baby has an intracranial hemorrhage. It can lead to lifelong disability or the baby may even die. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, is an acquired coagulation disorder. Numerous causes can lead to intravascular consumption of platelets and clotting factors, mainly factors 2, 5, 8, and fibrinogen, and this can then lead to um, consequent hemorrhage. DIC is often seen as a complication of septicemia, a patient with shock, as well as perinatal asphyxia. Upon investigation, you may determine intravascular hemolysis with fragmented red cells on the blood smear. As already stated, consumption of platelets will lead to a thrombocytopenia. On coagulation profile, the PT as well as the PTT will be prolonged. To assess the fibrinogen activity, one can perform the thrombin clotting time, which will then also be prolonged in a DIC case. During coagulation, fibrin is deposited and this is then degraded to form fibrin degradation products. So if you do the FDP, it will also be increased um, due to this abnormal process um, due to different causes. Please review the third year lectures, and specifically important would be hypoglycemia as it is a medical emergency. The management of a baby of a diabetic is really important, um, just to know about Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. And then there are numerous disorders regarding the calcium phosphate and magnesium metabolism, as well as disorders of the electrolytes. So please review those, and then hypothyroidism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia.